All right, today you're going to hear a fascinating story of Mary Harris, who later would become Mary Jones, who the world would know as Mother Jones. So here we go. There she is, Mary Harris. Uh, this is also a story of an immigrant because her whole story is just all the different places she's migrated and the changes she's had there. So keep that in mind while you're uh, listening along. Here we go. She was born in Cork, Ireland in 1830. Uh, she and her family left Cork, Ireland when she was seven uh, because her family was escaping the Great Famine. Uh, when she arrived, um, she first lived in Canada and her father got a job working for the railroad and she went to school. Um, later on, she became a teacher in uh, Michigan, and then she was a dressmaker in Chicago. Um, and finally, um, she migrated to Tennessee, and that's where she met her future husband, George Jones. Uh, so before we get too deep in this, I want you to look closely at the picture of these people from the time. This is the time that she lived in. This is her as an older person. And just look closely at the faces of the people in the background. Don't worry about their hats. Don't worry about their clothes. Like, look at their faces and realize that these were living people who, well, I don't know. I don't know. So in 1861, Mary and George got married. She was a happy, blushing bride. By 1867, she had four beautiful children all running around in the yard, and George was active in the unions. Life was pretty good. Well, sort of. By the time 1867 was over, all four of her children and her husband was dead from yellow fever. In one year, she lost all of them. Okay, enough said. Now we're gonna do some epidemic statistics. <laughs> Here we go. Um, the yellow fever epidemic uh, was pretty bad when it hit. It hit in multiple years. Um, a lot of the symptoms look like a regular flu, but then if you look at what the severe cases are at the bottom, you would actually, your skin would actually have a yellow tinge to it and also in your um, eyes, they would have like a yellow tinge. Um, so, I mean, check out those symptoms, that's not good. Um, I'm going to show you a few of the historical markings on different places where the yellow fever hit in our country. Um, when uh, This one, for example, is, um, is in Louisiana. Um, when the yellow fever hit there in 1873, look how many people died. 759 in this town in Louisiana. Uh, um, and so all of them were buried in the cemetery, but there were some that were found in a mass grave called the Yellow Fever Mound. There literally wasn't enough people left to bury them. Here's another historical marker, and I'm going to read this one, the first and second paragraphs of it. So here we go. On the first paragraph, it says, In four public lots known collectively as no man's land lie the remains of at least 1,400 victims of the great yellow fever epidemics of 1873, 1878, and 1879. Memphis lost over 8,500 citizens to the disease. It's crazy. Okay, so now let me skip to the next par the last paragraph. It says, by 1878, half of Memphis's citizens fled the city. Yellow fever struck 90% of the remaining population, killing 5,100. The epidemic so decimated its population that the city of Memphis became bankrupt in 1879. Okay, so now if you think about while all this is going on too, the Civil War was happening in the 1860s. So our country was just, I mean, like, I don't know, calamity, I guess is the only word you can describe it. Here's what Mother Mary says about it. Here's what she says. If that doesn't hit you, I don't know. That, that, I mean, that hit me, okay? By the time the year 1867 ended, everything was gone. 
So Mary returned to Chicago and worked as a dressmaker. She ended up having her own shop and she lived in the shop. And for those of you who know history, you know what happened in Chicago in 1871. This is a picture of Chicago after the fire went through. Now, by a weird coincidence of history, Mary took shelter in the same place that the Knights of Labor held their meetings. So if you want to, pause this video and go look up what the Knights of Labor did, and you'll understand why she was so inspired. But the question is, who is she inspired to help? Okay, before we get to who she helped, Listen to her story of migration. Now, if this was my class, I would make you do the worksheet on the front side. <laughs> so if you want the worksheet on the front side or whatever, let, send me an email and I'll send it to you. Or just give me a note in the comments, okay? But I love this poster. Look at what she says. She says, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. I love that. So the question is who she's going to help. Well, let me tell you about the typical working life back then, and you're probably going to figure out who she wanted to help. In the 1860s, during the height of the American Industrial Revolution, it was typical for a person to work 11 to 12 hours a day. That means your job starts at 8.10 a.m. and you clock out at 7.10 p.m. That's a typical day. You typically worked six days a week, not five. You only had Sunday off. The daily rate of pay in the 1860s was $2 for a man, a dollar for an unskilled man, and 33 cents for a woman or children. So here's the question. If you were a business owner, who's the cheapest workers? Guess who Mother Mary wanted to help? I think she wanted to help this kid. There's two of them at their jobs. Look at that protective foot equipment he's got on. I think he wanted to help the, I think she wanted to help this kid. This is a loom for like making blankets and jackets and you know, things like that. But then we got old Neil here. This one's Neil. Neil was nine years old when he first went to work, but he was 11 years old when he lost his leg. And here we have Clinton. Clinton was 12 years old when that mowing machine right there cut off his hand. And you notice he's right back at work because there ain't nobody else who's gonna do that job. You know, I mean, I believe he was working on his family's farm at the time, and if you don't mow the stuff, then um, you, you're not gonna be able to get the food. So, I mean, his arm is literally in a sling, and he's still working. Okay, look at this kid. Number one, I love his face. Look at his face. He looks like a kid on a recess on the playground. Now look closely at his finger and uh, this knife that he uses in the canning um, company. He literally has to bring this knife to work. And I'm not sure he's actually wearing pants. That kind of looks like a potato sack to me, sewed together by his mother. So we kind of have an idea of how poor these kids were and how, I mean, this is our country that we're talking about here. And this is the history of child labor in our country. So what did Mother Jones say about this? This is what she said. Little girls and boys were barefooted, walking up and down the rows between the endless rows of spindles, reaching thin little hands into the machinery to repair the snapped threads. They crawled under the machinery to oil it. They replaced the spindles all day long and all the night through. Tiny babies of six years old with faces of 60 did an eight-hour shift for 10 cents a day. If they fell asleep, cold water was dashed in their faces and the voice of the manager yelled above that ceaseless racket. Toddling chaps of four years old were brought to the mills to help the older brother or sister. Here's the thing, though. You had to be five to get paid. So they were just there working for free, and nobody did anything about it. Look at this kid. This is what this kid says. He says, I got my hand caught in the cogs of the spinning machine, and I lost part of my finger. It stopped the machine, and I tell you it hurt. It pains me a lot now. Don't you think they ought to pay me when the wages while I'm out with this bad hand? No, I can't read or write. 
but I think my mother knows how to spell my name. So the first thing Mother Mary wants to know is, why isn't this in the newspaper? Why aren't people reporting this? Look at this kid selling newspapers. Look at that, he doesn't even have shoes on his feet. So she says, why aren't the people, why isn't this in the newspaper? And every reporter she talked to says, well, all the mill owners own the newspaper. So that made her really mad. And this is what she says. She says, well, I've got stock in these children and I'll arrange a little publicity. So the question is, if the newspapers won't print it, how does she bring this story to the public? How does she tell the people, look at what you're doing to your children? How does she tell the millionaires, look at what you're doing? Well, she has a way. Watch how she gets publicity. Read this. You see how this woman changed history? You see it? I mean, look at the faces of these kids. Don't they look like someone you know? But yeah, she dressed them up real nice, gave them real nice clothes, and put them on the stage. Here she is again. By 1900, there were 2,250,000 children under the age of 16 working in the United States. Don't think that's gone. Today, there are 200 million children working across the world today. Of those today, 73 million are under the age of 10. But that's statistics for another time. That's another presentation. All right, now let's talk about how Mother Jones changed the world. Look at what she did. The biggest accomplishment of Mary Jones was this 1902 Children's Crusade. Um, she had children, they marched across the United States. And so she, as she walked across the United States on her way to Washington, D.C., she would, you know, talk to the children, talk to the parents. Hey, can I, you know, can I borrow your kid for a minute? We're going to Washington, D.C. And she took, there was a large group at one point, but, you know, kids get tired. So by the time they get to Washington, D.C., the group's a little smaller. But they literally went to the president's house, the White House, and were chanting, we want to go to school, not the mines, chanting, chanting, chanting. The president at the time didn't even come out. After her death, when another group went on strike, they called themselves the Daughters of Mother Jones. And here's, here's a little funny fact, too. That song, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, it's about her when she crossed the Appalachian Mountains with all these children marchers because they knew she was coming. Like, this is an amazing story. So the question is, how does Mother Mary's actions affect you today? Because this sounds like 100 years ago, right? But that's a pretty big question. How do Mother Jones's actions affect you today? Well, for starters, the age that school children start for America starts at age five because that was the age you could go to the factories. So she worked really hard to get the schools to do that. Um, what, what happened is a lot of times um, when, it, when they wanted school to start at age seven, sometimes kids have been already been working for two years. The, the families became dependent on that money and said, you know, and, and said, no, like, I'm not going to send my kid to school because I, I need the money that they're making. And so that's one of the reasons that our country starts at age five, where other countries don't. Um, but uh, yeah, we have um, Mother Jones and that time to thank for that. Uh, the other thing we have to thank for Mother Jones is um, the child labor laws that are in the United States right now. She also helped the unions uh, movements that were happening in the United States at the time. And so because you have eight hours a day and Saturdays off, that's also her thing. And she also aided the women's movement. So I hope this little presentation kind of reminded you that, you know, we've always had epidemics, we've always had pandemics, um, but we've always had heroes. And uh, Mary Jones is one of the heroes that rose uh, from a pandemic. And, well, it's just really interesting to know our history, too. So go look up the Children's Crusade, go look up the Children's March, and go look up the name of that president who wouldn't even come out to see them. All right. Happy learning, everybody. All right. I'll see you guys soon.
Bye.